Hello, friends, and welcome to Looking Up. This is a podcast for Christian women. I'm Kathy Pollard, one of your hosts. And with me is Carla Moore, my dear friend and your other host of this podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about a topic that we've been tossing around for a little while and thinking would be a great subject for an episode because we think it's something that's probably going to hit women of all ages. Don't you think so, Carla? Oh, absolutely. And not just women. I know it's, it's men too, but true. You know, obviously we're just talking to women here, but oh, true. yeah, that's true. It, we're going to be, ta- all. we're going to be talking about body image, but before we get into that, how are you doing? How is your holiday weekend? What's going on in your world? I am doing well, a little bit out of breath. It's been, I went and saw mom, just got back from seeing mom and uh, she I mean, doing? she's, she's doing okay. She's doing okay. She's getting around really slowly, but she, um, she is our biggest fan, no doubt, because she talked all about every episode. She's, she sits in in front of the TV and has it on YouTube most of the time. So she knows what we're wearing. She talks about (laughs) different things. She, she even said something about how, how you're so cute when you do something with your mouth. I don't remember exactly what it was. (laughs) Yeah. But (laughs) He just thinks you're adorable. And, and I, do well, I think it. she's adorable. So since she's listening, hi mom. Yeah, she's, she's doing all right. But it, I, I just got back from there and the holiday weekend was good. We, we went and um, had the more fishing trip at the bend and, mm-hmm. uh, and it was, it was fun. We had some rain and they caught about six catfish, I guess. And um, did you eat them? Of, we did not. Uh, oh there weren't quite enough for the number of people that we had. And so I don't know how, but Jordan ended up with them. So I guess he'll fry them up and do some family fish fry at some point, but, um, but it was good. We got home Sunday afternoon and Monday, we, we did some yard work and kind of just chilled because that was the first time we were home in two and a half weeks, really. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and we went to Mike and Courtney's for dinner on Monday night. So that's what we Aww. did. What y'all do? Y'all what, been barn wait, raising. I, we have, but I have to know what you had for dinner at their house. At Micah's house? Yeah. He made, he made burgers, but you know, he doesn't do anything halfway. He made really, really good hamburgers and he made jalapeno poppers that those are the um, sliced mm-hmm. jalapenos. And then they mm-hmm. were filled with cheddar and cream cheese and some other kind of cheese and then wrapped with bacon and then mm-hmm. grilled. So they're smoky. And then he puts them in the oven to crisp, crisp them up at the end. So we had that, we had grilled corn. Mm. Um, he had French fries left over from the fishing trip and he has a fryer. So he fried them. So yeah, Weight Watchers, what? This kind of fits right in with the whole body image episode we're about to talk about. Huh? Oh, well, that's nice. Yeah, it was fun. He's so, very talented in, in multiple ways. He really is. He mm-hmm. is. And most of those showed up after he left home or maybe they were dormant while he was home. Mm-hmm. But, um, but it is fun watching to see the different things that he does. All of he them. builds things and he cooks and yeah, he does. He Very does. Nice. Yeah. So how's the barn coming? Ugh, it looks amazing. It's they, um, we ended up with more help than we thought mm-hmm. we were going to have. And some other guys from church came out and they have all these big fancy tools and equipment things and got that thing up and it looks amazing. And so Jeremy ordered the roofing material yesterday morning. Mm -hmm. And um, so when that comes in, they'll get that on there. And anyway, I just keep looking at it. I keep Mm -hmm. looking out my back window or walking out on the deck and staring at it and walking inside it. (laughs) Yeah. It smells good because it has that fresh cut wood wood. smell. I love that Mm -hmm. smell. Yeah. Yeah. So So what color are you painting it? You said something about green, but I I, you said, you know, I did. And we actually already bought the paint, but I think I've changed my mind because Minwax has this stain that, that, that comes in a bunch of beautiful colors now. Mm -hmm. And their color of the year that they just rolled out is called aged barrel. And it's kind of a grayish brown. And Mm. I absolutely love it because um, it looks very natural. And then, of course, the, you know, color of the wood and all that will come through. And it's really pretty wood. So I like aged barrel. Yeah, by Minwax. I like that idea better than doing like a solid color on it. Uh So I asked Neil about it today and showed it to him. And I said, do you like this? Because I'm really loving this. Oh, that is pretty. Yeah, I think I want to do that for the barn mm-hmm. and maybe save that 
other paint for something else. Like we, our basement door downstairs needs painted and stuff mm-hmm. like that. So, and you said the roof is going to be white. Mm-hmm. Won't that be pretty too. with that, with that, that color? That is. H You'll barrel. have to get Janelle yeah. to make you another sign. Cause did what happened to your chicken coop sign? It's still on there. We oh, still okay. have the coop, but that part of the barn hasn't been built yet. It's going to be an extension, like a little shed extension off of it. Yeah. And she made a Kathy's coop sign. And that's what Jeremy said the other day. He said, you need a great big sign. This is Kathy's barn. <laughs> yeah. Or Kathy's cow. Yeah. With a K. <laughs> yeah. You could do all kinds of things. Yeah. That'll be fun. Well, that's fun. Mm-hmm. I know you're going to love that. And I can't wait to see, you know, a year from now, what it, what it's going to look like and what, what your cow's doing. It's just going to be fun. It is. It is. I'm very excited. And Oh, the news that um, Sister Betty Winkler passed away. I wanted to talk about that because she was such a remarkable woman and her husband, Brother Wendell Winkler, was a huge mentor to Neil. Mm -hmm. Um, We both went to Faulkner and my dad even told me, and I wasn't a Bible major or anything, but my dad even told me, take all the Wendell Winkler classes you can. And I did. And, um, And I remember when we were, Neil and I were first married, and had Gary, we were in Livingston, Alabama, and there was um, working with a small congregation, and we had a brother window Winkler in for a gospel meeting, and Miss Betty came with them, and we have a picture of the four of us together. And is that the one you shared? Yes. Mm-hmm. And then in 06, it was my very first time going to PTP to speak, and I was really nervous. That's when it was in Chattanooga, and um, I went by myself that year, and. We were eating at a, at a, like a, I can't even remember now, some kind of train restaurant or something on site. And Miss Betty was sitting at another table and she called me over there and just spent a few minutes talking to me, encouraging me. Mm. And I just remember thinking how sweet of her to take the time to do that. And she, she's just that way with everybody. They both were, they were both such people, people, you know, to, invest in other people and encourage other people. And, and um, I just wanted to take a minute to remember her and talk about her and yeah. how blessed we were to know her. I didn't ever meet her. Um, you know, obviously I know Dan and and they mm-hmm. passed that kindness and wonderful personality onto him. And I don't know the other brothers, but um, what a fantastic, you know, I hate to say power couple because it just, I don't know the term kind of turns me off a little bit, but they were, yeah. you know, they mm-hmm. affected and influenced so many people for good. And mm-hmm. what a, what a great family. I think that if I remember right, this is, this is way back in my memory, but Wendell Winkler held a meeting in Wimberley, Texas, when I was a, probably 12, 13, maybe. Mm. And I think that that's the first time that I ever saw John. And of course, oh, he would, if, if I was 11 really? or 12, he would have been 14 or 15. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's just way back in my memory. And huh. uh, but I remember I remember him. And that was, I think, the only time that I ever heard him preach was at that meeting in Wimberley, Texas, years and years ago. But what a oh, man, we just use so much of his material mm-hmm. that is still so relevant. You know, a lot of times things that have been written it's not that they're not relevant anymore, but they, they get kind of dated and we want to refresh them. But honestly, when I look at the things that the Winklers have done, I just don't think it needs any refreshing. It's just still so well-written mm-hmm. and relevant and, and things that we really need still all the time. Mm-hmm. I think of heart diseases and their cure. That's the one I thought of when you said mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And th- that series, I can't remember what the series, but those booklets that are mm-hmm. um, towards spiritual maturity, isn't that one of them? I'm pretty mm-hmm. sure that's another yeah. one that he wrote, mm-hmm. but yeah, just such great material and they're a great mm-hmm. family. He came and held a meeting at Cold Harbor in Virginia. And by that point we had three small boys and mm-hmm. I don't even remember what the sermon was about, but he took these strips of paper, just ripped them while he was talking and folded them in half and hung them on the edge of the pulpit out in front of him. 
every time he'd make a main point, you know, he'd rip off a strip, fold it in half and hang it on the end of the pulpit. <laughs> and my boys, as little as they were, they were locked and loaded. I mean, they were just staring at him. <laughs> what is he doing? What was the point of having the papers? Was it I just don't even remember that. Well, they just, remembered it. The boys yeah, died. but it, it kept their attention the whole time. And <laughs> I'm sure there was a point and it was really good. Yeah. That's just, that was a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you had three really boys in your lap ago. during a lesson. I, exactly. I don't remember much of anything. Uh, I had we, moms that have kids in their lap have my total respect because oh, I remember those too. days. Mine too. Yeah. Having to get surviving. up and walk out with one little one and your other two following along. <laughs> Especially when your husband's the preacher. Right. Right. I always feel like a little parade walking all the way to the back of the church building. <laughs> yep. And everybody's turning and looking. <clears throat> yes, Did any of yours yes. ever scream out anything like, don't pinch me or, you know, no. don't hurt me, mom. Not that I've, I've heard that from others, but they did, you know, when you grab them under the arm in that little sensitive place or mm-hmm. between the legs, a couple of times, Gary said, ow, <laughs> out loud. And I think I've shared already the time that I, I decided to leave the older two in the auditorium. I don't think I remember this. Uh-uh. Well, I thought Carl needed to be nursed mm-hmm. and we always sat up front. And so I decided that the other two are probably old enough to leave in there by themselves just long enough for me to take Carl back to the nursery. And so instead of parading all of them back there. I just got up, walked out with Carl, sat in the rocking chair in the nursery. And, you know, we have the little speaker in there where you can hear the sermon and Mm -hmm. Neil's preaching along. And then all of a sudden he just stops. And I hear him say, isn't that right, boys? Uh (laughs) I know. And I was like, (laughs) (laughs) hurry up and stop nursing and grab him and go back in. I was mortified. I was like, well, obviously it was too early. Too what's, early. What's the age difference? I forget. Gary is there's, how much older than Carl? There is than Carl. There's two years and two months between Gary and Dale, and then mm-hmm. two years and seven. So Gary seven would have been about between. four or five at that time. And yes, Dale only yeah. about two. Well, you're yeah. brave. Well, <laughs> it's not like they were totally isolated. Yeah. There were people sitting right behind them that I guess I was hoping would thump them on the head or something yeah. if they missed yeah. me. You know, that reminds me, I don't know if I told you about this, but it equipped um, Emily Hatfield was giving her lesson Mm -hmm. one of the days. And it happened to be the same time that Robert was giving his lesson across the hall. Mm -hmm. And so she brought her two little kiddos, adorable little kiddos, and kind of put them against the wall in a couple of chairs in the row in front of me while she was giving her lesson. And I think maybe the woman that was sitting next to them knew her, but mm-hmm. I wasn't real sure because she said something to her about they should be okay. And they've got their books and their colors and, and, uh, and I didn't think anything of it because, you know, preachers, wives and moms that speak, mm-hmm. you, you just have to do what you have to do. And it was, it was just really, really so sweet to watch them. They were, they were so good. You know, they were just coloring. They weren't silent. They're kids. So they, mm-hmm. they weren't like sitting there little angels and nobody expected them to do that I don't mean that they weren't Emily if you listen to this they (laughs) were little angels but you know they I'm just saying that they weren't silent they caught my attention a few times because I just thought they were so cute and I couldn't see everything that they were doing because they were kind of on the floor and in their chairs and they were a little bit diagonal from me but they were on the row in front of me but at some point during Emily's lesson did I tell you about this Mm -hmm. at at some point during her lesson she got kind of choked up about something Mm -hmm. And when she did, both of the kids immediately stood up and locked their eyes on her and they were so in tune with her, her voice and what Mm -hmm. she was saying, you know, they didn't really know they hadn't been paying attention to what she was saying before, but when they heard that emotion, I got tears in my (laughs) eyes and I was all choked up just watching them. I know, but as soon as she, you know, whatever point Mm -hmm. she was making, as soon as she got past that and her voice regained control, they just sat back down. They were fine. You know, they weren't, they weren't worried anymore, but it was just so neat to see how in tune to her they were. And it was just, just the neatest thing. 
So sweet. So yeah. sweet. Those were hard days. I remember. Yes, I do remember. I remember Neil always saying, how was my lesson? And I was like, what lesson? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't get to hear any of it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah. sure it was wonderful. <laughs> mm-hmm. Maybe ask somebody else that heard it. I, honestly, one of our, one of our biggest conflicts when the boys were little was I didn't hear anything. Like you said, I didn't hear the lesson. I'm just trying to keep up. And I only had two because Micah came along. He's like eight years younger than Jordan and six years younger than, than Jake. Mm-hmm. So I basically just had two, but, but as soon as the, the lesson's over, you know, John went to the back and I, I didn't, I would stay in the pew with him, but I always wanted him to come get one of the boys at least mm-hmm. and, and keep up with them. So I could talk to people, you know, but he, <laughs> we've talked a lot about this. This will not surprise him because he, he, feels bad about it, but he was, they just felt responsible to make sure he connected with everyone and mm-hmm. shook hands and stuff. And I'm still, you know, juggling the, a two-year-old and a baby. And so, yeah, that probably is another whole topic for, for us to talk about someday. I was just huh? thinking we could just spend the rest of the time sharing stories right mm-hmm. now, because, but maybe we should, maybe we, might we need should to do that. think about a... them before we talk about them. Huh? <laughs> that's true. That's true. <laughs> Uh, it showed up in my memories either yesterday or today. I can't remember, but 10 years ago today, I shared something that you posted hmm. 10, 10 years ago. Back when we were just in our thirties. Yes. Or something. That's, you may I, have known. You wouldn't have been in your thirties. I wasn't for sure. That's, that's not anyway. the point. The point. Okay. Sorry. That's not the point. 10 years ago today, you posted, um, my wonderful friend, Alice said this today about our friendship. We are alike in all the important ways and different in all the enhancing ways. I thought Mm -hmm. that was really neat. And I hope all of you also have friends like that. Yeah. And that just struck me because 10 years ago, I could have never guessed that we'd be where we are today. And that's Mm -hmm. exactly how I feel about you. And I thank God for that, that we are alike in all the important ways and different in all the enhancing ways. And it just struck me. I thought... I'm going to copy that down and I'm going to share that. (laughs) Thank God for that. Well, that's Alice Stone. She's one of my best friends. She lives in um, Lubbock now, but they they lived in, she was born and raised. No, she wasn't born there, but she's, she spent a lot of time in Alaska. And so from Alaska to Lubbock, the, the beauty I can't say is in Lubbock that is in Alaska, but they live close to the kids now. Well, that's what matters. (laughs) But when you, you had brought up the topic and we may still do this, I'm sure we will. Women that we've learned from, she is one of Mm -hmm. she's a woman that I have learned from a lot of different things. So I'll save that for when we do that topic. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I did want to talk about uh, the conversion story that Matt Wallen shared Mm -hmm. with several people. Um, What a cool story. And I know you've already heard about it too, Mm -hmm. but um, he shared the story about this guy named Kith, K-I-T-H who's from Uganda, but currently living on the island of Cyprus. And he's a second year student in college. So apparently he started studying the Bible on his own, on his phone. He didn't have a hard copy of the Bible. He started reading it on his phone and for several months was just studying and on his own came to realize that he needed to obey the gospel Mm -hmm. and what all that involved. Mm -hmm. Well, there is not a Lord's church on Cyprus. There's not a body of Christians there. And, and so then, um, and apparently in that time also, he made use of several resources like Apologetics Press, GBN, House to House, World Video Bible School, Mm -hmm. and all those materials. He was reading all of that. Well, Matt Wallen um, had some friends who were teaching in Israel Mm -hmm. and their names were Rod and Victoria Selman. Well, Mm -hmm. they flew to Cyprus and spent a few days with Kith studying with him some more and ended up baptizing him in the Mediterranean Sea on the Mm -hmm. east side of the island. And um, Matt Wallen added that he was baptized just two and a half miles south of the ancient city of Salamis, which is one of the first stops on the missionary journey of Paul and Barnabas mentioned in Acts 13, five. Yeah. So how cool is that? Well, and then they stayed with him a little bit and studied with him some more before they had to go back. And Kith is already studying with um, another friend of his, you know, hopefully the Lord's church will grow there and Mm -hmm. he won't be the only Christian on the Mm -hmm. island. 
But in the meantime, Matt Wallen said that he suggested that Kith find an established congregation to at least worship with online yeah. um, and get their bulletin so he can feel connected to a body of believers and stuff like that. So he recommended Lehman Avenue. Oh, cool. Church of Christ, where, where we worship. And um, Matt called Hiram to tell him about it. And then Hiram told Matt that we are all going to be in Cyprus in October. Oh, I forgot about that. Yeah. So now we will get to meet Kith and hopefully we'll get to spend some time with him and encourage him. And I'm already envisioning how wonderful it would be to sing a few songs together and, Mm -hmm. you know, meet our brother and our new brother in person and encourage him. So I just thought that's, that's the most amazing, amazing story. It is. Mm-hmm. It is. And I, what I, one of the things I love the most about it is how many people worked together to find exactly, you know, a way for him to be baptized and, mm-hmm. and to be encouraged. And I, I really honestly, truly can't think of anybody better than Rod Selman to go encourage this guy because he's a new Christian. And, um, I, I, he sent me some pictures actually, and mm-hmm. I imagine he won't mind if we share them, but it's just such, such a great, a great story. I, I think <laughs> that it would be a neat thing for World Video Bible School to do, to have a new series. I'm just going to throw this out there and I've mentioned it, but I don't know if it's ever gotten high enough to make a, a ripple, <laughs> but to have a series called Conversion Stories. Mm-hmm. And we even, when we were in Singapore in 2018, we recorded Peter and Pui Fan Chin's conversion story. We, John and I set up our phones and I put one angle and he put it on another angle and and they've been I guess that's still in the cloud somewhere. We haven't been able to do anything with it, but they each talked about how they were converted to Christ and, and they have a fascinating story. Pui Fun was a, she was transcribing the Bible for a man who basically he was a, he was an American. I can't remember what he was doing there, but um, she was transcribing the Bible. She did not know that's what it was, but he Mm -hmm. told her, okay, he told, he explained to her how to look up you know, when it says this word, go find it on this page. And then when it says that this, it's what's a chapter and a verse, and he explained all that to her. And so he had her transcribing scripture writing, basically. Mm-hmm. And, um, and she did that for quite a while. And as she started learning more and more about it, she started questioning him about it. And then studied with him one day. I mean, they just had a day that they set aside to study and she obeyed the gospel. And, you know, with those Eastern religions, the mm-hmm. family impact for someone who turns their back on, on that religion is, is pretty devastating. Yes. So there was a lot of cost counting that went on anyway. Wouldn't that be a cool thing would if, really if, be if they great. had a conversion mm-hmm. stories and talked to people about how they made the change and were converted and turned from the old life to the new. And, um, that story about Kith would be super exciting and, and, um, just encouraging. Well, even when, even here, you know, when we have people over sometimes on Sunday nights, we would go through the alphabet, you know, and have people over by their last name. And yeah. one of the things that we would do sometimes is ask people to share their conversion story. Yeah. And it's just, I mean, we all do the same thing to obey the gospel, mm-hmm. but to hear everybody's different ways of learning about God and um, who taught them you know, sometimes the connections and you can just look back and see how God put people in the right place at the right right time to be exposed Mm -hmm. to the truth. Mm -hmm. And it's just so inspiring to hear everybody's story and how, you know, I grew up in a Christian home Mm -hmm. and my dad was a gospel preacher like yours. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I heard it from the time I was little. Um, but so many people have remarkable stories that you can really see God's hand in. And if somebody has a searching heart and they're hungry for the truth, uh, they'll find it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They'll find God will put people in their path. Mm -hmm. Uh, This, I I don't want to be misunderstood, but I've said this before. In some ways, I'm a little bit jealous of people who Mm -hmm. have had to really search and seek and find, because I feel like it was, I don't know if it's the right right way of saying it, but like it was handed to me Mm -hmm. and I didn't have to go digging and finding my mom did. And I know that others have, and it really, I don't want to say it means more, Mm -hmm. but I think 
I don't, maybe in some ways it does. Maybe it's more precious to you when you've had, when you, when you've had a life without it and you've had to go find it and, and find the truth. So that's, um, that's just something would you want that. Would you want that for your boys? Would you want them to have not grown up in a Christian home and had no. to find it as an adult? No. And so I, that's what I mean. It's kind of a hard thing to say and hard to explain, mm-hmm. but, but so I know what you mean. I've thought right. about, I've thought about that too. I've thought yeah. about that too. I just think it's, it's, um, maybe they, maybe they even understand it better than I do in some ways. I don't know. Just or maybe it's about. easier for us to take it for granted True. sometimes. Yeah. And I, I do know that there were some things that happened well into my adulthood that made me realize maybe I still had a bit of an affiliating faith instead of my own faith. Yeah. You know? Oh, I have no doubt about that. I know mm-hmm. that mine, I mean, I'm a little embarrassed to, to say, and I won't how, how long it took me really to have my own. And I know that, that I did have my own faith, but just to have a really solidified knowing that it's mine and not my mm-hmm. parents or my husband. So, mm-hmm. and that, yeah, anyway, yeah. that's a great story. I love that. Glad yeah. you brought it up. Shall we get into our topic? Let's do it. All right. So we're going to talk about body image. Mm-hmm. And, um, body image is, I looked up all these different things and basic, and let me just throw this out there (laughs) Let me just remind everybody, you know, we'll say things like I looked this up or I found this or whatever, but overall, this is a pretty unscripted episode, unscripted, unedited, and we stand by that. And sometimes we'll (laughs) say, let's, let's talk about this topic. And we're not exactly sure where it will land. Right. <laughs> so mm-hmm. I feel like this might be one of those topics. hundred percent, hundred percent know that we could have some great conversation about it and talk about it for a long time, which we won't. Um, but maybe, but who knows where it will land, but yeah. body image is basically how you feel about the way you look mm-hmm. to simplify it. And it could be positive or negative. And as I was thinking about, you know, maybe the direction we might want to carry this topic, I started thinking, well, what's the difference between that and vanity? Are we talking about, you know, you care too much about about the way you look. And so it's really vanity. And, and I don't know, because I looked at vanity and that's excessive pride in one's appearance. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think it, it could cross over into vanity if, that's your, if that becomes your focus, but really body image is just how you feel about the way you look. And it affects all women of all ages. I was even surprised to read that girls as young as eight years old can start having negative self-talk about their own bodies. Where do you think that comes from? Oh, I'm sure it comes from everything that we're inundated with. I mean, our culture is saturated with how we look and, you know, um, the perfect image and, you know, everything has to be just so and just right and just perfect. And Mm -hmm. I mean, it could, if we're going to be honest, it could come from influence in the home and how much we as moms talk about it, you know, but eight years old. Yeah. I try to think back to when I was eight years old and what I was doing and mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure I didn't care. No, I know I'm pretty I sure I was Clueless. still playing outside in the dirt. Yeah. <laughs> not climbing trees when I was eight years old. So yeah. I remember mom, she would diet. I remember, you know, I'm just laughing thinking about the different phases of diets that we mm-hmm. have as a society been through. And I think I remember her, she would have a hamburger on a lettuce leaf instead of on a bun, just stuff mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I don't have any memories of that other than me thinking, Oh, I'm glad I don't have to do that. I don't ever <laughs> want to do that. Right. But when you're talking about how in the home we can be affected by the things that our moms say. And I think it can happen very innocently because, mm-hmm. and I don't have daughters, but I can see how knowing what happened to me as far as, you know, when I got married, I gained a lot of weight because I just cooked what I wanted to. And I didn't have really any, I'm sure people tried to tell me, but I didn't really have any nutritional information to, to think about pasta being, I made pasta all the time. Cause that's what mm-hmm. we liked. It was a comfort food. Mm-hmm. Anyway, just thinking about 
how that happened to me. And if and I would want to save my daughter from doing what I did. So I, I wonder if I'd have had a daughter, would I at eight years old or whatever, what I've said, you need to make sure you eat some salad with that. Don't eat all, you know, is it that kind of thing where, where the body image comes from? Just innocent little comments like that. I think it could be, and it could also be a mom's, her own self-image of herself, you know, um, constantly on the scales or talking about gaining weight or wanting to lose weight or not like, you know, her husband compliments her and she deflects it. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I know I've done that a lot and, you know, not that we intend to do that, but they're just exposed in every direction to so many things that have to do with body image. And it was Mm -hmm. really interesting to me. I heard a conversation the other day that was talking about AI Mm -hmm. and how, you know, it used to be that you could tell somebody those girls that you're seeing in that magazine have been airbrushed. You know, nobody looks like that in real life. Well, now the images in the magazine aren't even real. Yeah. At all. (laughs) They're Mm -hmm. just, and they they look real. They look real. They were talking about this image of these two women that were fashionably dressed and, and a little bit older. And the whole article was, you know, looking good doesn't have to do with youth. It just has to do with style. And then come to find out the entire image was artificially, artificial intelligence created. Mm-hmm. However you word that process. Yeah. yeah, it wasn't even real. And mm-hmm. so, and by the way, a little bit off topic here, but I also learned from that conversation that um, conversations can be generated that never happened. Yeah. Mm-hmm that there was a conversation that two people had that was put on the air and those two people have never actually talked or met in real life. Yeah. It's, but you wouldn't know scary. that, you know, so it's so easy to be deceived, but do we know that when we're seeing those images and those people and those models and those fashion and those influencers that are curated just right, you know, um, it's just everywhere. And what a, what a focus and emphasis is being put on that. But It might have body image might have to be, you don't like the weight that you are. You don't like how short you are. You don't like a physical feature about your body, which your nose look different. I know my entire life, I was self-conscious about my teeth and we didn't have a lot of money when I was growing up and I never had all my friends got braces, but I didn't get braces. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so there were many pictures of me as a kid where I would not smile with my mouth open. <laughs> mm-hmm. I did that whole awkward. From what age you know, did, were you self-conscious about that? I don't know, probably 12 and up, you know, and, um, and then, so as an adult, when I was married and on my own, I went to the dentist and I was like, I would like to get braces. And then I, they told me I had like a crossbite and they would actually have to break my jaw and set it to do one thing and then re-break my jaw Mm -hmm. to reset it and do something. (laughs) Anyway, I was like, actually, they're not that bad. I'll just, (laughs) (laughs) I've had them for this long. I'll just hang on to them. And but, you know, for years and years, that's just, and now I smile with my mouth open because I'm like, well, <laughs> you just have to get over yourself. Yeah. You're just going to have to have the wonky, you'll just be the one with the wonky teeth, you know? And it's so funny because just the other day, this came up because we've been talking about, you know, body image and all this other kind of stuff. And Neil said that, um, he was like, your teeth are my favorite thing about you. Hmm. And I went, not ah, and he was like, yes, they are. And I know, first of all, Neil's just being Neil. Yeah. That's just the way he is. But my whole point in sharing that is we think of something as just this huge thing, this huge deal. And then other people just see it as that's what makes you unique. Mm-hmm. You know, that's just you. That's just who you are. And have you ever been one age and thought, man, I wish I would lose 10 pounds, or I wish I didn't have these crow's feet, or I wish I didn't have these age spots or, you know, and then years down the road, you look back at that same picture, you know, we were looking at some old photographs yesterday when I was trying to find that picture of Betty Winkler. Mm -hmm. And I ran across a picture of me from 20 years ago. 
and I looked at that picture and I thought, I remember how I felt in that picture. And I remember thinking, I wish this and I wish that and I wish, you know, and now I'm looking at it going, girl, you look so young. Yeah, I've seen you're, the gifs that say, I so wish I youthful. was as fat as the first time I thought I was fat. Exactly. <laughs> look at that youthful skin. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So better, better reconcile it now because it's only going to get worse from here. Yeah. Is that the, that'll cheer you up. <laughs> yeah. And I have to say this for a second. I'm going to cough because I caught something over the weekend. So if I cough, I'm sorry, it's unavoidable, but I mean, I have to, I know we want to avoid the, oh, you're fine kind of thing, but Mm -hmm. I have to agree with Neil in a a lot of ways, because there's just something about your smile with your teeth that makes your smile is wide and genuine. And I love that about you. And so I, and I'm, I know you weren't fishing for any kind of compliment and you probably don't want me to draw attention to it, but I mean, <laughs> it's true what Neil said. I just think that it, it enhances the way that you look. So Thanks. maybe <clears throat> I hope that you're not still super, I know you've said things before about it and um, I hope that it doesn't still bother you. Cause like you said, it, it, it is who you are. It's part of you. Some day, most days it doesn't. And then every now and then I see a picture that somebody snaps me and I'm like, wow, that's a terrible picture. (laughs) But that's vanity. I'm well aware of that. You know, I acknowledge it. Yes, there it is. (laughs) Yeah. Well, my thing, I have lots of different things, but my glasses and this podcast has been, you know, you know, you just, I, if I want to be able to see you, I'm going to have to wear mm-hmm. them and record mm-hmm. myself. But anytime I take a picture, I pull my glasses off because mm-hmm. I, I don't like the way I look in them. It just, I feel like my eyes are like, you know, <laughs> this big. And uh, so I think when I take a picture of myself without my glasses, I probably people are wondering who I am because most of the time they see me with my glasses on. So I think you look, you look the same with or without your glasses. Your eyes lot. look the same. Okay. I will trust you, but I still, when I see a picture of myself in my glasses, and sometimes I just do it anyway, but I prefer to have them off, but there's you, just, you have ahead. to trust me because in the last episode, you said that I was a friend that would tell you the truth when you asked me a question. Mm-hmm. <laughs> hey, I trust you, but I still probably will take my glasses off. When I take <laughs> That's, right. That's right. <laughs> but there's just all kinds of things that, you know, my, my story, when we got married in 1986, I put on, I don't know, I probably put on a hundred pounds from the time that we got married until, I don't know, 10 years later, but the majority of it came right after we got married. Mm-hmm. Like I said, just because I didn't, I didn't know that what I, I knew I was eating too much because it was just, I liked to cook and I knew what he liked and I knew what I liked and I didn't ever think about trying to, to be more cautious. I'd never had a problem with it. I just never were having babies. Yeah. Yeah. True. And so you put a little bit on and it's harder to take it off. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I stayed that way until 2011. So from 86 to 2011, and then I, I got on Weight Watchers and I lost about 70 pounds that year, but it wasn't nearly as much about what, um, what I looked like. I say that it it did have something to do with what I looked like, but I, I just felt rotten and Mm -hmm. wanted to feel better, but you know, body image, it has a lot to do with that. And I think that after some of it came off my, I realized how much it had to do with, um, a poor Mm self-image and a lack of self-confidence. And so I think that body image is tied up in that a lot. But I've heard a lot of people say that it's not. So one of the things that I was thinking about when we were preparing for this is that not everyone thinks the same, Mm -hmm. you know, not everyone thinks the same. Some people are completely happy with being a different shape, you know, as what I have to be, because I'm never going to be a model shape, but I want to be in a model shape. So not everybody Mm -hmm. thinks the same, you know, Mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. makes sense. It does. It makes sense. And, you know, you, the whole body image tied to self-esteem, I see that as a very natural connection. Um, But I also agree with you. I know a lot of people that, you know, they have a really, really great, confident um, self-esteem, self-image. It has nothing to do with how they look. And 
you know, they, to me, that's something to strive for. And Mm -hmm. that's a level of maturity almost, or even a spiritual maturity. And, you know, I've had little pep talks with myself through the years, good grief. In the grand scheme of things, this doesn't even matter. Right. Especially not going to matter in heaven. It's not going to help me go to heaven or get anybody else there. Have these little pep talks, you know, and I'm just going to not let it bother me and not think about it. And, and then I still struggle with it. So I think what really bugs me the most is how much brain space and how Mm -hmm. much mental energy and emotional energy energy goes into thinking about how I look Mm -hmm. or the size that I am or other issues that I won't even go into. You know, it Mm -hmm. really kind of disgusts me with myself when I think about how much time goes into worrying about that stuff when really it's God doesn't care about any of that. Mm -hmm. But I don't really know exactly what to do about that. Well, and we sound like a broken record sometimes because again, what's the root of it? What does it go Mm -hmm. back to? And I know that for me, a lot of it's pride. You know, I do want to look my best and feel my best and I want my genes to feel better. Yeah. J-E-A-N-S, right? (laughs) Not (laughs) G-E-N-E-S. Exactly. Uh, And, you know, it's pride. It's, it's important to take care of ourselves and be healthy so that we can be useful vessels, you know, for God, but you can take that too far and you can be too consumed with it and obsess about it and um, spending too much time in front of the mirror, if you will. (laughs) There's a balance. It's a balance and, and having a healthy perspective. Um, never, ever letting it become the focus that it smushes out spiritual things or, you know, becomes unhealthy and something that you obsess over. So Mm -hmm. So I was listening to a podcast today, trying to, you know, think about what we were going to talk about. And one of the podcasters was talking about having a healthy relationship with food and how kids, and I see this with my grandkids, they eat when they're hungry and they walk away from it when they're not. Mm-hmm. And their source of happiness is not food. It's playing or, you know, whatever. Did you hear that fly? Mm-mm. It just went zooming past the microphone. So that'll be interesting to see if that comes across. Um, but, but they, what is my relationship? You know, do I, what's at the root is, it, do I eat too much because I like the taste of it or do I eat to live Mm -hmm. and you know what exactly does this have to do with body image but I guess because um because how we eat determines weight that we put on or uh, just sometimes I think we're we just don't have the right relationship with food Mm -hmm. and and that probably stems from a lot of different things I think a, a particular friend that I have grew up not knowing where her next meal was going to come from. And so she always cleaned her plate, Mm -hmm. you know, every time. And she still does because she had that ingrained into her. She didn't know when her next meal would come. So she ate when she could. Mm -hmm. And now that she doesn't have to worry about that, she still, still has that relationship with food. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's rough. Yeah. Well, and then there's emotional eating, Mm -hmm. you know, boredom, snacking. Uh, I, that's a hard one for me because I love food as in, I love to read cookbooks. I love to bake. I love to try new recipes. You know, I love to watch cooking shows and I like talking about food. Let's Mm -hmm. do a podcast about food. You're a foodie. (laughs) Yeah. And so, and also I think that the Bible has a lot to say about food, you know, and I know that there's the argument that food is just fuel. And it's just a matter of survival and you just eat what you need. But I don't, I don't know if I would go that far. Mm -hmm. I just think that the Bible talks about the land flowing with milk and honey and, you know, and I haven't really done a study on it, but I know that there are several references where food is held up in like a, a bless, a light of blessing and a good thing and a reward, you know, not, not that the way we do it, here's a slice of cake as a reward, Mm -hmm. but um, obviously you can take that too far. Uh, when you use it to 
to comfort yourself, you know, or stress eating or things like that. And it becomes unhealthy for you. Yeah. So it's, it's just that word balance again, you know, you have to have a healthy perspective about it, a balanced perspective about it. God wouldn't have made flavors and colorful foods and things Mm -hmm. if we weren't meant to enjoy it. But Mm -hmm. like you said, balance in all things, we just get so off balance Uh Mm -hmm. and it's a discipline. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, like have a little serving of ice cream. What's the mm -hmm. real serving supposed to be? Three tablespoons. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> whose real serving is that <laughs> now, you know how in the carton it'll say one serving has so many calories and yeah. then you find out the serving is like a fourth of a cup or something yeah. and yeah most you get... people put three cups in their bowl and yeah. You... <laughs> yeah. so you know you can enjoy it but don't eat the whole carton and and maybe that's just something good to know about yourself I have a friend who at times goes without eating sugar all together because they know once they start, they can't stop. Yeah. They just, once they get a taste of sugar, they just eat and eat and eat and eat and eat Mm. all the cookies. And knowing that about, you know, knowing that about yourself, sorry, might mean you have to put some stricter things into place or whatever, but it's a, it's self-control balance, healthy perspective. I was also thinking about comparison too, Mm -hmm. because that it's been said that comparison is the thief of joy. Mm -hmm. And I think that's so true Mm -hmm. because wow, with AI going on now, we, I I hope, and I don't know how, but I hope there's some kind of regulation on that because the more I hear about it, the scareder I get of it. Mm -hmm. But just um, if like, I mean, I, I'll just be honest with you. When I compare myself with you, which I know I shouldn't, but your size. I think you're just the cutest, perfect little size. And I'm sure other people do as well, but I can get dissatisfied. And I've learned not to do that because it just, like I said, it, it, comparison is a thief of joy and, and learning to be content with the way God made me. And yet knowing that I have some control over, uh, and maybe that's another thing we need to talk about in this, in this, um, episode is, is control you know, having self-control and that, how that's a a discipline, but, um, sometimes food is the only thing that someone can control in their life when everything else is out of control, they can control what they're putting in their mouth. And so maybe they overdo it or they underdo it just because they can control that. But back to comparison, just thinking about, um, we just, we have to be super cautious that we don't get caught up in that and, and think of, um, of our friends. Well, I don't, if I were her size, I would be happy, mm-hmm. you know, because you have your own things going on in your mm-hmm. mind and in, in your life. And so I, it's not fair for me to say, to put that on you, that you should be happy the way you are, because to me, you're better. You, you look better than me or whatever, whoever's maybe saying or thinking things like that, mm-hmm. because I just think that the devil can get wrapped up in comparisons too, and make us dissatisfied back to our topic of dissatisfaction. But, yes. um, you know, just being super, super cautious, not to be caught up in, in comparing ourselves with someone else. I jotted that down too, because I thought what feeds this and what makes it worse. And comparison was the first thing that popped into my mind. And, um, I don't know why we do that. I don't, Yeah. there's, but we do, especially women, I think, you know, and there's always going to be somebody skinnier, taller, leaner, more toned, mm-hmm. more fit, perfect teeth, you know, whiter teeth, smooth skin, whatever. There's always younger. There's yeah. always going to be that person mm-hmm. and, you know, <laughs> Calling it for what it is makes it seem so petty, just like all these things that we've talked about. It seems like in recent episodes, you know, the things that I'm dissatisfied with about my own body. Um, in the grand scheme of things, if I if I verbalize it out loud, it just mm-hmm. sounds a little bit petty. And why, mm-hmm. you know, why do we compare ourselves to others when that's not what matters, you know? Right. And um, I think you're right about Satan using that to keep us from focusing on what's really important. And so if I walk into a room and I'm looking around and I'm cattle, 
you know, kind of placing myself in the spectrum of this person skinnier, taller, leaner, or whatever it might be, instead of walking in the room to say, I'm going to go cheer up this person, talk to this person, lift up this person, you know, who can I serve? Who can I? Mm -hmm. Um, and it's just that we just put, the, when we're comparing, we're just putting that focus on ourselves and, yeah. you know, it, that never, and right, right now we're talking about body image, but we do that in other areas, mm -hmm. talent, um, you know, relationships, skills, smarts, <laughs> money, yeah. you know, all of these areas, and they never lead to anything good. Mm -hmm unless it's something that you see as a good positive mm -hmm. trait that you want to develop in yourself and grow in, in yourself, you know, and use that to encourage you to grow spiritually or step out of your comfort zone, you know, and in that way it can be good. But most of the time we're just not comparing ourselves in ways that are good and healthy. Yeah. I was thinking about the popular girls in high school, um, for lack of a better way of saying the, the, the in crowd, you know, mm -hmm. and every high school, I don't know what it's still, surely it's still like that, that there's a certain clique of girls that, and guys that are the ones that everyone looks at and goes, Oh, I wish I could be like them. I wish I could have their clothes. I wish mm -hmm. I could do my hair like that. And, you know, thinking back to the eighties, like when I graduated high school and the perfect wing, you know, <laughs> the wings that, and I never could get my hair to do that or Jordash jeans, Gloria Vanderbilt jeans. And, you know, my, my parents purposely avoided some stuff like that because they just didn't want me to get caught up in, in designer stuff. Obviously we mm -hmm. couldn't afford things like that too. But my point is when I think back on those girls and there were some very sweet girls in that crowd, but for the most part, when I think of them, they were, they excluded people. Mm -hmm. And again, I don't want to, I don't want to assume motives because I didn't know them very well because, you know, I wasn't necessarily part of that. I had my own circle of friends that I was happy with, but you, you know, you can't, there's always the group that you look at from afar and just think that they have it all and they have it easy and they're so pretty and they, they dress so cool. And, um, I just, but there's not really much about them, honestly, that I wanted to be like. They did not draw other people into their circle. They, they didn't, they weren't. <laughs> and again, I want to be careful because I, I, this was just my perception as a 16, 15 year old girl, you know, mm -hmm. we all wanted to be like them physically, but not necessarily in any other way. Mm -hmm. And I think we can still be that way at our, mm -hmm. at our age, you know, we can be, have this exclusive little click and maybe look a certain way that people want to be a part of, and yet we don't have any of the characteristics that God wants us to have. Mm -hmm. But when I think of who I'm drawn to now, it has nothing to do with how they look and has everything to do with, um, how, how they look like God. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 my prayer for myself is that I want to look like God and not look like some other person or not have some unreasonable expectation of myself to have you know, the perfect hair, the perfect, whatever, just all the mm -hmm. stuff that's on the outside, all the physical stuff, but it's hard to not want to look good. It is. And isn't it interesting that it's not just a teen girl problem. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you think about certain things like peer pressure and something like this topic of body image, that it's really a young girl thing. And by the time you get to be our age, psh, yeah, no. no, no worries, no worries, but mm -hmm. it's just, it's just something that you can struggle with. And if you don't get a handle on it or a, a healthy, proper perspective of it. And, and I think that maybe, I'm sure every generation says this, but maybe now more than ever before, girls growing up, especially with the AI and mm -hmm. the, you know, having it on your phone 24 social seven, media. all these images, yeah, comparison, social media and influencers. Um, how do they, combat or fight back or not take on that kind of focus mm -hmm. with it coming in 24 seven, you know, and how can we help them and ourselves um, instead think about what you were just saying, you know, what's true beauty, what's, what's truly attractive mm -hmm. about a person. Um, you might find 
physical characteristics superficially attractive at first, mm -hmm. but what really draws people and attracts people to you is your brightness, your warmth, your personality, your desire to serve like Christ, mm -hmm. um, your lack of arrogance. You know, these are the, your, um, when you have an interest in other people, when you're not focused on yourself, these are the things that make people want to be around you and find attractive about you. And so how can we um, help turn the tide and, and focus on those things with our young girls, with some of us older girls? I always think of, um, and I'm conscious of this, saying to my granddaughters, you're so pretty. Mm -hmm. And and they are to me, but um, saying things to them like, I love how you did this, or, you know, I love how sweet you were to your mom, or just complimenting things besides their physical appearance, even mm -hmm. though, you know, I don't think it's wrong to do that. I just think that they need to hear other things from us besides uh, you look so cute. Mm -hmm. But oh, there's something else that I've thought of <clears throat> that I want to be careful in how I say too. It's, it's important to me that John likes what he looks, likes what he sees when he looks at me. And mm -hmm. that's always been important to me. And, and he's always made me feel very confident that he likes what he sees when he looks at me. Even when I was at my heaviest, um, it, you know, it didn't affect our relationship. I think that now that I have lost some, he, I know that he, <laughs> <laughs> he likes what he sees, but, um, but I, and I don't even want to say lose weight and you'll feel better, but I do think that taking control of your health, trying to take control of your health can be so helpful and so, um, just good for you in so many different ways, mm -hmm. but here's where I'm going with this. Let's veer it off topic for a second. Okay. You're I up. think... <laughs> When I think of what men see when they look at pornography, it's not real, mm -mm. but especially for young men, they get caught up in that and it's such a trap and it's such a, it's just a killer, a killer mm -hmm. of so many, so many things in the, in the young man's life. And I know it can happen to, to women as well, but but I've just thought this so many times how when, when men start falling into that trap of pornography and they're looking at women that are not real, they're looking at, even if women are, you know, not AI, if they're real women, but yet they're doctored up or they're airbrushed or they're surgically altered, or, um, you know, they're just all these things that feed into what's so unhealthy to, for, a, for a man to see. And then I think, I guess this is more cautionary for men, but if, if they get caught up in pornography, are they going to be, are they going to have a difficulty or, or I don't even know how to say it, but when they, when they are married to a real woman mm -hmm. who has the gained a little bit of weight because of having their child or because they've been trying to feed them and, and, you know, nourish her own husband or just life, because we don't, none of us have that perfect body. And if someone, and I say perfect loosely, because who gets to decide what a perfect body is? And it's just, it's not, it's not realistic, you know, the Barbie body, but um, I just, I just think we, we have so many different shapes and sizes and bumps and lumps and, and wrinkles. And, and when we change the way we look at things, the things we look at change. So if we can look at them in a favorable light thinking about, you know, yeah, that lump is there because I had a baby mm -hmm. or that wrinkle is, it's a laugh line. And again, you know, I'm guilty of trying to cover things up and it's not necessarily cover things up. I guess my hair, I'm covering up the gray in my hair, but um, <laughs> it's just a matter of, you know, wanting to look nice, I guess, mm -hmm. but that balance of not overdoing the wanting to look nice with, with not putting in the time and the work with my relationship with God and, and how I appeal to others on that basis, rather than the way I look. Mm -hmm. The, um, 
the wife of the man who's caught up in pornography feels like she can't ever compete with that mm -hmm. and feels less than desirable. But the truth of the matter is the guy that's even viewing pornography doesn't want that woman. Right. And he's using her for instant gratification or sexual satisfaction or whatever, but he doesn't want that woman. He doesn't want a relationship with that woman. And if he were honest with himself, there are things about his real life women that makes her beautiful because of everything that they've experienced together, right. childbearing, you know, scars from the kitchen fire or, you know, whatever it might be. It's, it's life that they've done together. Right. And I'm kind of glad you brought that up because, you know, the question I asked earlier is how can we combat all these images that are coming into our women? And then you brought up pornography. And I know that same question has been asked from that perspective. Well, how can a young man stay pure when they're bombarded with all of these images of women and it comes to them? They don't even have to go looking for it. It comes to them. Okay. But we know. You ahead. froze for a minute. Sorry. Keep going. All those images come to them, but we know that there is a way because the Bible promises no temptation, you know, mm -hmm. has taken overtaken you, but such as is calm demand and God will provide a way of escape. Where is that? First Corinthians 10 31 or 10 13, mm -hmm. somewhere around there. Somewhere. And, and, and we know it's possible. It's hard, but we know it's possible. And even we had pointed out that, um, that question in the Bible, how can a young man keep his way pure, you know? And so I'm glad you brought that up because as overwhelmingly difficult as that would seem, we know it's possible. Mm -hmm. And it's a matter of um, focus and determination. And you probably, you know, a guy probably will see some images, but it'll be up to him to look away and not go back to it. Mm -hmm. And so I guess in a way, the same would be true for all the comparisons and the images that are constantly thrown at us as women that we can't live up to make us feel less than yeah. or dissatisfied with ourselves or struggle with comparison. We don't have to get caught up in that. And, and if we do struggle with that, maybe we need to make some changes. Maybe we need to unfollow certain accounts or maybe we need to spend less time online or spend more time with real people who are not focused on physical things or themselves, but having others outward focus, you know, there are things that we can do to turn that around and help us have a healthier perspective. Yeah. Have you heard of Deborah Rainey? She's a, she writes, um, Christian fiction, inspirational mm -hmm. fiction. I don't think so. Um, she wrote this article and, um, she was talking about how her husband is a fitness guy. And when they were dating, she kind of fooled him into thinking that she was a fitness person too, like into <laughs> ath ath athletics and things mm -hmm. like that. But she really wasn't. Yeah. And she said it was a lot easier to fool him until after she started having kids. <laughs> <laughs> and she really didn't want to do anything. She didn't want to play ball with anybody. She didn't, you know, and she said, and then her body started showing that she wasn't interested in fitness and athletics and things, but he still was, and he was still pursuing it. And, and she said, it got to a point in their marriage where that became a source of contention yeah. because he felt like he was taking care of himself, but she wasn't even trying to take care of herself. Yeah. And she was, the whole point of it was she was talking about how, you know, she started making smarter eating choices and started walking and things like that. And she said, she'll never be the fitness freak that her husband is because she doesn't just love it, mm -hmm. but she knows she can try to take better care of herself and she will never look like this perfectly lean mm -hmm. model. <clears throat> she said, but her husband doesn't expect her to. And really for him, it was all about the effort. Mm -hmm. You know, it, at least she was trying to take care of herself and trying, you know, caring more about um, her health and how, how she looked for her husband. And so yeah. I thought that was a really good point that a lot of times, you know, here's the standard that we're placing for ourselves, or we think that our husbands or somebody else is placing it's way up here and it's unattainable and I'll never mm -hmm. look like that. When really 
the healthy balance is just do your best to take care of yourself in a God honoring way um, so that you feel better, um, feel your best, you know, can serve your best and you look like you're putting some effort into yourself. <laughs> so what is that God honoring way? I think that would be helpful to talk about. What is God honoring way of taking care of ourselves? Well, another um, example that I ran across, they were saying how to, how to know if you're out of balance, you know, mm -hmm. and you have it in the right perspective. And they compared the body image. Let's say that your body is a car, your vehicle. And there are some people who are obsessed with their car and they will spend the entire weekend, you know, polishing, waxing, buffing, you know, not a single smudge on a window, vacuuming you know, cleaning the upholstery and mm -hmm. all these hours because their car has to look like pristine. Yeah. And, um, and then you've got the, the other extreme where this person obviously doesn't care anything about their car because it's always trashed. There's always food in it and stuff mm -hmm. on the floor and it smells bad and it looks bad and, you know, they never take care of it all. Well, both extremes aren't good. Neither one mm -hmm. of them is good. You know, you just want a car that's kept in good working order kept clean, run smooth, you know, because it's your vehicle from getting from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. And they said, that's, that's a good checkpoint for how you look at your body or the emphasis that you put on your body. And, you know, do you spend hours and hours in front of the mirror because everything's got to be just so, and you obsess about it and you can't have any smudges <laughs> and you got to yeah. polish everything up, you know? Mm -hmm. And so you're spending all this time on appearance. Um, or, you know, the other extreme is I don't care how I look or how I feel. I'm not going to take care of myself. I'm not going to, you know, I'm just going to let myself go. Mm -hmm. And that's not good either. Right. But to think of our body as the vehicle that takes us out into the world so that we can serve others, yeah. you know, for Christ and making sure it's in good running order and we're taking care of ourselves and we look clean and nice, mm -hmm. you know, and I thought that was a good yeah. comparison. I think about self-control and mm -hmm. how biblical that is and how we can um, be so out of self-control where we're just putting everything in our mouths and not doing, having any kind of um, ec physical exercise. You know, that's, that's a lack of self-control. Mm -hmm. And I think that God wants us, and I know God wants us to be self-controlled. I think I know that those are, that's a, um, a qualification for an elder, but I know that's, that's also in there for us and other places mm -hmm. that, that, he, that we're to have self-control and, and not, um, be ruled by anything other than by, by Christ, by the Lord. So are we ruled by <laughs> the dinner bell or the chocolate or whatever, where we just, we have no control over what we put in our mouths. Can we not tell ourselves, no, I'm not going to have that bowl of ice cream, or I'm not going to eat another serving of macaroni and cheese or, you know, whatever, just a lack of self-control and, and learning to have self-control. That's, that's a process. I don't think that you go from one day of having zero self-control to the next day. Okay. I'm going to have self-control today. It's a process of denying self and, and saying, I'm not going to do that because first of all, because it indicates that I'm, I have no self-control or because it's not the best thing for me, uh, or just getting up and moving some when we're sedentary all the time. I think, um, just getting up and, and look at the creation that God has given us, especially when we're up in Colorado, I think this is just beautiful. I love getting on my bike and, and going out and seeing the mountains and it gives you time to think. There's just a lot of things that I, that I have learned over the past 10 ish years that, um, that you just feel better about yourself when you have self-control. And I think God wants that for us. Yeah. Your digestive tract will thank you too, when you move more. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. There's <laughs> but don't you think that you have to kind of mentally get to that point? Sure. Where no one can okay. force you into it. No. And, and it really is a mindset. You just have to, something has to turn that switch on in your brain that says, okay, this is it. I'm going to start practicing self-control and you have to make that determination yourself and you have to feel that commitment for yourself. But then 
the amazing thing is as hard as that seems at first, when you really, really, really want that slice of pizza mm-hmm. um, <clears throat> and you deny yourself, you know, and you practice that self-control as hard as that is after a while, that self-control starts feeling pretty good. Yeah, and yes. it, you feel better, not just in how you feel physically, but just mentally, the fact that you can do that, mm-hmm. it feels good yeah. to practice self-control. And I think it kind of bleeds over into other areas of your life too. But some of the things with body image don't really have to do with self-control. You know, like, I don't like the, if I don't like the way my nose looks, I don't like my, my ears are long, my eyebrows are, my eye, you know, whatever we could point out about ourselves that we don't like, that we can't do anything about. I don't like how short I am. No, no amount of self-control is going to change how mm-hmm. short I am, mm-hmm. but I still think it's a mind game, you know, and mentally you kind of have to get to that point where you're like, well, you know what, (laughs) sitting here griping about it to myself or criticizing myself, um, not being happy with how I look, that's not really working. Mm -hmm. And like you say, it, it consumes all this brain energy and it's not really helping anybody. It's not helping myself. It's not helping anybody else in my life. And so in a way you kind of have to get to that mindset there too. And Mm -hmm. just determine, I'm just, I'm just going to rejoice in the way God made me and that, and that aspect and how Mm -hmm. my nose is shaped and, you know, how short I am or whatever it might be. And I'm just going to be thankful that I'm alive. And when I, when I struggle with those insecurities or things that I don't like about myself, maybe I need to have a little bit of a mind shift and find something to thank God for, or go do something for somebody else, you know? Yeah. And so yeah, we get so internal and we're just mm-hmm. self-centered. Honestly, we just are. Yeah. When I think sometimes about, uh, the, the selfies. And I know I like selfies. I took one with my grandson this weekend and I think y'all are fun really they... good at it, by the way, <laughs> you more well, people are the selfies persons. That's what Michael <laughs> always says. Yeah. Y'all are good well, at it. Um, but, but, you know, I like them from the memories attached. Mm-hmm. And I think that it, when I look back at pictures, I think, oh, I remember that day. But if that's all we're doing is taking pictures of ourselves and then there's 50 of them because we can't get ourselves look exactly, you know, I don't like that one. I don't like that one. I don't like that one. Okay. Mm -hmm. My nose looks better in this, whatever. That's an, that's excessive. Mm -hmm. You know, that's just an excessive. I really believe that that there's too much emphasis on the way we look. Yeah. And we didn't even bring that up when we were talking about young people is all the, the selfie culture mm -hmm. that we're in. And then you've got all the different ways that you can change the way you look, you know, all the filters. Yeah. Filters to make yourself look better or look a certain Mm -hmm. way. No wonder. When I was, when you were just talking, I was thinking about how God said we're fearfully and wonderfully made. Uh, Do we really, do we really Mm -hmm. believe that? You know, Mm -hmm. are we, Yeah. and then you think about the evidence for God's hand in our life and how the, the miracle of childbirth and the, just what your body does, you know, the, it heals. If someone created a car that was a self-healing car, you know, they'd be gazillionaires, but our bodies heal Mm -hmm. because God created us that way. And, and when I, I sometimes get aggravated with my caterpillar eyebrows because they get out of control, but they are, they remind me of my dad, you know, and it makes me smile because that's the way his were. And I just have to laugh. You know, I haven't always been to that point where I can laugh about it, but um, it it just, God made me that way. And so learning well, to live with things. What's your heritage? What's your, where are your dad's people from originally? Not real sure. But I mean, I, there was a, that's a whole nother story, but one day John sent me a picture from a barbershop in Jerusalem where he had gone to get a haircut and there was a man, it brought instant tears to my eyes because he looked exactly like my dad. So I mean, I don't know if there's some Jewish heritage or Italian or mm-hmm. Greek or what, but. Mm-hmm. Well, that's how I picture you. And in fact, mm-hmm. I think I've said that to you before, when we go to Israel, you look like you blend right in and all the women there are beautiful by the way, but you have those dark features 
the dark eyes, the dark hair, the tan skin, mm -hmm. you know, and I always think about that too. I always think you've got to have some kind of Italian in you or something like that. So yeah, I don't know. See, that's just perspective though. You look at mm -hmm. your eyebrows and think, blah, and I look at, I look at you and go, wow, you have these exotic looks, you know, exotic so, caterpillar exotic. eyebrows. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but there's another thing. Why do we deflect? Mm -hmm. You know, you're complimenting me and I'm thinking, yeah. Yeah. Why can't I just say thanks? Yep. Yeah. I don't know why we do that, but we do. Uh, we do. And from what I understand, husbands don't appreciate that. So. Yeah. Yeah. We there we go. have to learn how to graciously accept a compliment, right? Well, I feel like I should. Well, we're about to run out of town. I was going to say, maybe I should make a confession. No, no, you have to. No, I have to. But mm -hmm. um, so not long ago, you shared a picture of both of us in the looking up group on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Facebook and I hated that picture <laughs> and and in fact um you took it you were here at the house it was after I quit I mm -hmm. I was dog tired I'd been crying that day so cried off all my makeup and and there was just something about the angle it was not flattering at all of me and so anyway you had sent it to me on my phone and I thought those are the worst pictures I've ever seen but I didn't say, I almost said to you, please do not share those with anybody. But I thought those are so bad. She would never <laughs> share those with anybody. Well, lo and behold, they show up on social media. Mm -hmm. And I, my first thought was, Carla Moore, I'm going to kill you, you know. <laughs> and you said, and I quote, I look like a man with hair, long hair. <laughs> I did. <laughs> and I was in the grocery store and I literally busted out laughing because I thought it was ridiculous. You did not look like a man with long hair. Uh, so anyway, I asked you to take it down mm -hmm. and, um, that's, you know, that that's vanity and that's all it is. And all these people had already clicked like on the pictures and said these nice little things about our friendship and how cute we were and blah, blah, blah. And there I am feeling all petty. And I'm like, and I think you even said something about that, but people are commenting and I'm thinking, I don't care. Pull that picture down. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And you did because you're a good friend, but, um, you know, that's, so you want me to share it again? I do not Okay. No, I'm confessing, but I'm not saying I want you to share it again, <laughs> but that's what I'm talking about. This whole, yeah. you know, there's a point when it crosses over into, um, vanity yeah. and that's just different from, you know, taking care of yourself and having a good image and feeling good about yourself and, feeling good in your own skin and vanity is when you're so worried about what everybody else might think about something that's been put out there. And I've had a million horrible pictures taken of me and shared because I am that person that has to have a million pictures taken to find one good. <laughs> I am not photogenic. And most of the time I can't say anything to them because I'm not close to them. But if it's you or my sister, you know, I'm like, don't you be posting pictures <laughs> That don't, bring, no. that don't put me in a good light. <laughs> mm -hmm. But, you know, that was, that was bad. That was bad. I'm sure the picture was bad or you wanted me to take no, it. No, me when you take it. I'm sure you were disappointed in me. <laughs> no, no, I wasn't. I, I thought I did not think it was a bad picture, but there again, you know, I can, if it was on the, the shoe was on the other foot, I can totally understand. I would be like, ugh. Don't, don't share that. And we do have kind of an unwritten rule that we don't share without checking. And I, I don't know what I thought. I just thought it was a cute picture. And so mm -hmm. anyway, you do not have to defend yourself. I'm not, I'm not, I guess I'm just saying, I thought it was cute, but anyway, um, so actionable items, like before we finish mm -hmm. up, I think that we need to, so what can we do about it? Mm -hmm. What can we do to improve this area of our lives? Well, um, so if we struggle with negative body image, really, um, is what we're talking about. And so some of the things that I've sort of found and thought about was number one, find the source of your standard. And it kind of goes back to what you were thinking about. What are you comparing yourself to exactly, mm -hmm. you know, and, and why, Yeah. and why are you allowing that into your life? If it's causing you to feel that way, um, do so we want fine. people to admire us? That's kind of what, what I wondered. Are we wanting people to admire us? And if so, why? And mm -hmm. what do we want to 
them to admire uh, the way we look or the way we are. Exactly. Yeah. Do we want people to be attracted to us because we make them feel good about themselves? Exactly. Or because of how we look, you know, so that's just introspection right there. Fine. If you're really struggling with this, when we are struggling with this, we need to think about what is my standard here Mm -hmm. and what am I using for that? Um, is it all of these influences and things coming in from the world and things that I'm seeing this unattainable idea of perfection? Um, and then number two, focus instead on making others feel great about themselves. Wow. That's great advice. And because like doesn't, to focus off yourself. Yeah. And doesn't that always work? That's God's way. Mm-hmm. And it always, always works and yeah. just get over yourself. Don't be consumed about it. And, you know, and I'm not saying that there aren't times to do something about it. Like you said, sometimes it's a matter of self-control and making some changes and going for a walk or whatever. But when we're really just struggling with negative body image and we, it's turned into a bad attitude, mm-hmm. um, focus on making others feel great about themselves, compliment other people, remind other people of their value in the Lord. Mm-hmm. Um, And because like we were saying a minute ago, a woman who serves, a woman who loves, she's truly attractive. Yeah. And that's not why we do it, but focusing on others, that's, that's real beauty. And thinking about who, who do you really admire? Who is someone that you just really admire and you love and you think, I want to be like her when I grow Mm -hmm. up. Mm -hmm. And is it, does it have anything to do with physical beauty? And I want to say 99% of the time it's going to be someone that maybe not, isn't very attractive, you know, yeah. but Probably that's didn't what's have to do anything to do with their outfit. Yeah. <laughs> and their I wardrobe. Would, or exactly. Where they shop. Or so why like are we yeah. so focused you know, why is it that we're so inward about wanting to be someone that people admire for the way we look or the way we dress or whatever, mm-hmm. instead of wanting to be, I don't want to say wanting to be admired because of, of who we are, but I think if you know, we all want to be the kind of person that, that shows God that reflects God. So Mm -hmm. is that, you know, when they look at me, are they seeing God? Are they looking at just my perfect hair? Mm -hmm. That's not what we want. Right. Yeah. Good point. And then number three, when you struggle with negative body self-talk. So, you know, sometimes we're our worst inner critic and um find out what else is going on because a lot of times there's something else that's at Mm -hmm. the root of the problem and it could be relationship issues it could be spiritual problems you know sometimes that's just a symptom yeah of something else that's going on so maybe you've neglected to fill your mind with god's word Mm. and you know and so your focus has been put on other things maybe you need to express more gratitude and you haven't been doing that um so sometimes there's just something else going on so yeah what do you have nothing <laughs> <laughs> i just wanted you to have all the answers <laughs> no i mean i just had a little input here and there but i did think about i i tried have tried intermittent fasting for a while and i know you are have to and I have read that whenever you struggle during the time, during your fasting period, if you're, if you start thinking about food to pray. Mm -hmm. And I thought that's such a great way of deflecting what I'm really desiring to something that I really should desire Mm -hmm. because, you know, it's embarrassing to think about how much time we spend thinking about food and, you know, what we're going to make tomorrow, we're going to eat tomorrow. What, you know, everything we do socially is wrapped around food. Mm -hmm. We go out to eat or we have people over for pie and coffee or whatever. And, and again, I think it's, it's okay because in some ways, because God created flavors and social lives and we enjoy mm-hmm. sharing those things, but Fellowship. Mm-hmm. it's just um, having, learning to have a healthy relationship and not being consumed and obsessed by food and, and what we look like, mm-hmm. just being careful and cautious that um, whenever we have that urge or we have that desire, or that's what we're thinking about, make your, turn your thoughts to God, pray mm-hmm. and thank, or thank God for, even for that sense of hunger. Thank you that I'm hungry and I'll, you know, I'm healthy enough to want food. There's a lot of things I think we can do to change our thoughts. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Good thoughts to end on. Mm-hmm. And um, so that was body image. We weren't sure where we would land, but <laughs> it was an interesting conversation. Yeah. And so our random question that we'll close out with is 
um, one that you suggested, which I loved. So it was either share a special memory of your grandmother or something that you've learned from your grandmother. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, we ha- we'll have to do this again, uh, part two, because I have two grandmothers, but my mom's mom, my grandma was, if you knew her, her, her name was Lima and people called her Leapin' Lima because mm-hmm. she was always going places and she was always busy and doing things. And Things that I remember about her, um, I'd spend the night with her as a little girl and at night before she went to sleep, she would read her Bible and she would read it out loud, but not like super out loud. She was just reading to keep her focus. And so you could hear her reading just under her breath, reading her Bible. Hmm. And she was one that um, when we'd finish with breakfast, if there was anything left over, she would put it on the back of the stove and she would always say, in case some little man comes by she grew up in the depression and that's what they did. You know, in case somebody comes by and is hungry, I'm going to have this here on the back of the stove. I know it was just, that always just made such an impression on me because something that we would not think anything, half a piece of bacon. We, I mean, Mm -hmm. let's be real. Who's going to have half a piece of bacon. Okay. So (laughs) a little bit of scrambled eggs or something, she would put it on the back of the stove and keep it there. But Mm -hmm. she was a great cook or chicken and dumplings recipe, something that I always think about. And she was one at 80 some odd years old. She would tell me, I've got to go take some food to this little old lady and whatever uh, across the street. And I think grandma, you are a little old lady, but I love my grandma. She, she was um, grandma to me, to my cousin, Marcy, who came quite a few years after the rest of us cousins, she called her Gammy. (laughs) <laughs> but, um, she had, she had Alzheimer's for a long, long time before she died and didn't really know us, but she, she made a huge impact impact on me. I, I mean, that, that's just the tip of my fingernail, the things that she taught me, but I remember her for her kind and generous spirit and for reading her Bible at night. And, and she would go up to little boys at, at the church building. And she might say to one of them, when are we going to get married? It was hilarious because this little boy would be looking at her like, I don't want to marry you. I'm not marrying you. And she would laugh and she'd go on to the next little boy and say, when are we going to get married? So that was my grandma, my mom's mom. I'd love about to hear, you? We, should, we should do an episode about that because I'd yeah. love to hear more about it. Mm-hmm. And I know you were close to your grandmother too. Yes. Her name was Emma Bell. She was exactly 50 years older than me. And um, I learned to sing alto from her. Mm. And I would sit next to her in worship and I just, I can still hear her alto voice and I can still hear all the songs that we sang when I was growing up. And, and some of those songs that we still sing today, I hear my grandma's alto and, Mm -hmm. and she was a Bible trivia queen. She -hmm. knew all the facts, all the Kings, Queens, major prophets, minor prophets. Wow. I mean, everything. And amazing. Yeah. She was Bible class teacher and but she was very frugal. And um, so she would, you know, she was one of those that had, she would fix the same meal on certain days of the week, every Monday, the same thing, every Tuesday, the same Mm. thing, you know, and that same with lunch, she fixed my grandpa the same lunch. And, but when she would do an ice cream sundae, it was always one scoop of vanilla ice cream. And do you remember the Hershey syrup in the can? Yes. With a the very, little yellow lid. Yes. She, you know, mm-hmm. used the can opener to open mm-hmm. that little triangle opening and drizzle on just a little bit of Hershey syrup. She would put a tiny sprinkle of crushed peanuts on there. And then she would take one maraschino cherry and cut it up into tiny pieces and sprinkle that on top of it. Mm-hmm. And so that was her ice cream sundae that she would fix for everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, but like you, I have some hilarious memories, you know, she would get, I think I got my competitiveness from her <laughs> because if we were playing canasta and she was heavily losing or whatever it might be, she'd go, Oh, this is a stupid game. Don't ever ask me to play again. <laughs> so, oh, that does sound familiar. <laughs> I know I quote her sometimes, mm-hmm. uh, but she was wonderful. So. My, my other grandmother played canasta. Oh, really? She had one of those shuffling card machines. Yeah. Know, we used to play with that. Yeah. That was fun. Yeah. Well, the, this was your mom's mom or your dad's mom? My dad's mom. And what'd you call her? Grandma. Grandma. So mm-hmm. we both have grandma. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Back in the day when you just had grandma or just, grandmother. Yeah. Or, well, I did. My other one was Meemaw. Oh, yeah. So well, kind of a different name. 
All right, so that was a sweet way to end. And um, who knows what we'll talk about next time. But ladies, we want to thank you for listening in and joining us. Please visit us over at our Facebook group and let us know what you think about this topic and your (laughs) thoughts on body image. We'd love to hear from you. We always do. And uh, we appreciate you spending time with us over there. And um, Carla, I appreciate you. I love you. Thank God for your friendship. And I hope you have a great next week and I'll talk to you and until then keep looking up I love you